Hello, everybody. I think we'll go ahead and, uh, and get started. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity, since this is our first sort of gathering on Bonk, um, to welcome all of you, uh, both those of us joining, uh, those of you joining us in person and those online, uh, for gathering for the 20th meeting of Interdisciplinary 19th Century Studies. Um, this year, it's the Green Conference, and we've gathered here to think about the history of sustainability and environmentalism. These are troubled times, and I'm really, really grateful that you joined us and are helping to make this experiment work. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that this event is taking place in downtown Los Angeles on the ancestral homelands of the Gabrieleño Tongva people, who uh, centered in the Los Angeles Valley Basin. In thinking about our relations, most of us as settler scholars to the lands we inhabit, I want to note that our virtual program, our webcasts and our online forums, don't really live in the clouds. This conference lives also in the international network of offices and homes from which virtual presenters and our online audience are joining us. And it flows through the various far-flung servers and applications that are carrying our digital feeds. We've worked to make this carbon footprint small. But as a result, our geographical footprint is quite large. So I'd like to take a second to imagine how we might acknowledge all of the homelands of the various indigenous peoples that this program for a time will occupy. And I'd ask that you think, from the vantage of where you live and work, what other spaces and which other peoples that includes. We have many, many people to thank for this program, and I will at the reception this evening. Here I'll just say that we would not have been able to support our speaker's visit without a major support from the University of Southern California's provost, from the dean of the Dornsife College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences, and especially from the English department at USC. Now for the intro. As an academic, I get to introduce speakers pretty regularly, but it's a singular pleasure to introduce a writer whose work so continually inspires and teaches and whose books think so powerfully about the nature of our world and its future. Kim Stanley Robinson, or Stan, grew up here in Southern California, and it's clear that this environment, in particular, its histories of violence and occupation, and the long struggle to balance human flourishing with natural beauty, sustainability with daily life, has left a deep mark on his writing. His novels and short fiction have received a long list of accolades, including multiple Hugo, Nebula, and Locus Awards. But I think that it is this abiding concern for the world, how it works, how we might fix the damage we do to it, is what keeps me coming back to his writings. And there are other things, too. He received a PhD in English literature from UCSD, and he studied with the great literary critic and philosopher Fred Jameson. He gets to call him Fred, and I'm really envious. And so sometimes in his fiction, you get these marvelous inside jokes about literary theory. I'm not going to retell any of them, because I would ruin them. But they make me laugh. But it's Robinson's lasting concern for how we're changing the planet and how fiction might help us both to understand and address those changes that keeps me coming back. As Amitav Ghosh has pointed out, we're in a profound struggle to find modes of artistic making and activism adequate to the climate crisis. We don't have the strong forms of collective action we need to coordinate the kinds of response required. We don't know enough about our dependency on other things, living and non-living, to accurately predict the outcomes of the changes we need to make. Stan's writings as a whole represent one of the most continued, imaginative, and focused attempts to figure out what kinds of collective understanding we need to meet these problems. His books ask us to roll up our sleeves, figuratively and literally, and get to work reshaping the future. So as I've been working on this conference over the last two years and trying to figure out how to synchronize our lives, uh, the technologies that support them, and the cross currents of wider national and international events, I've been thinking a lot about a scene from 2312, uh, a novel about uh, th that year, which looks at the longer impact of what he calls the, quote, great dithering a failure of the nations on Earth to take action to combat climate change during the 21st century. 
Much of the novel takes place on variously colonized planets in our solar system, especially on Mercury. And in the scene I like to think about, or, or I'm drawn to think about, two of the characters are forced on a long march for more than a month through an underground network, uh, a tunnel system in Mercury. They have to keep going, even though they are both ill, and they have to learn to coordinate. They have to carry each other, and to do that, they have to find patterns, rhythms that will help them for a time get in sync. They sing songs to each other. They figure out how to build on what the other offers them. It's like the world's longest, most grueling duet. But they live, and it changes them. Yet there's something about the simplicity of the problem, how to find the right kind of entrainment to survive and grow, that I keep coming back to. Ursula Gwynn wrote that all communication is a kind of entrainment. As she put it, quote, we huge, many-celled creatures have to coordinate millions of different frequencies in our bodies and our environment. Most of the coordination is affected by synchronizing the pulses, by getting the beats into a master rhythm, by entrainment. Successful human relationships evolve entrainment. They involve getting in sync. And if it doesn't, the relationship is either uncomfortable or disastrous. So I'm very excited to hear Stan's talk today because I think it marks a special kind of entrainment, the synchronization of making and reflecting, of creative production and critique, of history and the present. And after the last few weeks, I think it'll be nice to get in sync with something that, like that, something that will lift us far away from the uncomfortable and disastrous. So please give a warm welcome to our first plenary speaker, Kim Stanley Robinson. Well, thank you, Devin, for that kind introduction. And I'm very happy to be here. And for me, uh, an unusual uh, talk, uh, a try, an essay. Um, and it's going to be about periodization and about structures of feeling within periods. And this is partly because being invited to speak about the 19th century and wanting to um, talk about an event that happened in 1911, I needed to um, do the work of periodization. And I think everybody will agree that the 19th century definitely lasted, you know, to 1911, if not 1914. And so that is, uh, I think, well understood to all that um, it was Jameson who wrote, I think, in his essay, Periodizing the 60s, that we cannot not periodize, that it's a, a function of being a historian. And I very much like the Raymond William form, uh, Williams' formulation of structures of feeling as a way to talk about worldviews or paradigms. So I, I think there's something uh, evocative about the, the phrase and Williams' explication of it, of structures of feeling that go along with a particular period. And uh, certainly, um, theories of history are revealed by um, the periodizing scheme that you use and apply. It's basically the practical application of a theory of history. So um, that will become clear here. But I also want to um, talk about a specific case study of what happens when you live from one period across the divide into another period which I believe is um, the explanation for the greatness of this book, The Worst Journey in the World, by Apsley Cherry Garrard, who I, like everybody else who, who uh, knew him and write about him, will call him Cherry from now on. That's how, that's how he was known. And this is my own uh, copy of his book, um, which I bought in a used bookstore in Christchurch, New Zealand in 1995 when I was on my way to Antarctica, and I like it very much for um, the, the cover from uh, his friend and leader, Bill Wilson, uh, but also note a postscript 1948, also published by the author. Um, so this is 26 years after first publication, and he was still worrying away at it. It was his only book. And the, it must have had three or four prefaces and postscripts as the years passed. And he kept coming back to the, the topic, which was the central event of his life, without question. And um, I think that even this 
object uh, suggests that in a way that I, I like a lot. So the Scott Expedition, um, 1910 to 1913, is pretty famous. And I'm going to try to assume that most of you, being 19th century people and historians, know the basic outlines, which I think everybody knows. Well, that's the wrong way to put it, but um, you know what I mean. Um, the, it had a double function, and this has, has been well analyzed, is the, um, was the cause of, of, one of the many causes of why it came to grief, was that it had two um, uh, purposes at once. One of them was the race to the pole, which was going to be staged from here. So they got there in the, um, the end of 1910 would be springtime, and went through spring, summer, fall down there, getting ready, and then through the winter, and then the following spring, uh, which would have been late 1911, they headed for the South Pole. Um, and then it was also a scientific expedition. And here, the, um, because it was funded by the Royal Geographic Society, uh, kind of a, a basically an NGO, a private public organization, um, was privately funded in part. And um, in fact, there wasn't much in the way of government funding. And so getting to the pole was one important point. But also, they were thinking of the expeditions of uh, Captain James Cook. And they were thinking of Darwin and the Beagle. So when they went down to Ross Island, they, they had 12 scientists. There were 25 of them that wintered over that first winter. And 12 of them were scientists. And the, they wanted both. And uh, the funding was such an issue that, in fact, our our uh, Cherry was a young man, 24 years old at the time he took off. He was there entirely because of his uh, generous contribution to the um, funding of the expedition. Um, so they, uh, he was a rich young man, a landed aristocrat, and had um, gone to Eden and was a rower, and then was sent down south because he gave them a thousand pounds and they made him assistant zoologist for which he had no qualifications whatsoever. So this split identity was not good for either part of the expedition. Um, and, and there were more splits than that. They didn't know exactly how they were going to move across the ice to the South Pole. And they took down with them dogs, ponies, three experimental motor cars, and then, of course, some skis and ski poles for man hauling. And in that first season down there, they, um, they tried out all these things. They practiced them, uh, spring, summer, fall, taking short expeditions, and they were bad at all of them. <laughs> One of the uh, motor cars ended up on the bottom of the bay when they were offloading it from a ship onto a boat to get it to shore. It fell overboard right from the ship, and it's still on the bottom of the Ross Bay. Um, the other two were kind of steampunky experimental vehicles that were maybe 40 years ahead of their time in terms of technological capabilities. And although they, had, they were precursors of World War I tanks in some ways, they just didn't work in the ice down there. They had um, a competent uh, horse and pony keeper in um, Titus Oates, uh, uh, who had been a cavalryman, but uh, Scott bought a bunch of clapped out Siberian ponies that were near death and, and ready for the glue factory, and that's what Oates had to deal with. And Oates truly hated Scott, partly because of that. The dogs, they had a dog master that didn't know how to deal with the dogs, and somehow they couldn't control huskies in the, in the polar regions, which everybody else has a a great time doing, and yet they couldn't manage to do it, and Scott took a prejudice against dogs. And then lastly, even though they got on skis, their ski meister, a Norwegian, was had never skied in his life and was teaching the rest of them to ski. And and you'll, you'll see later that they were skiing entirely with one pole, a long alpine pole. And if you've ever skied, the idea of just having one long pole it just shows you uh, how disconnected they were. And eventually, they came back to man-hauling. So this is a period in a structure of feeling, late imperial Victorian Britain. Um, 
the G.A. Henty, Boyne's own, um, the Crimea, Tennyson, that whole structure of feeling that all of you are probably very much more familiar with than I am had inflected their notions of what they could do, that essentially the British could do anything by pluck and grit and by their native ingenuity and their, by their British toughness. So they refused to learn anything from the Inuit people. You'll see that they wear canvas hats, that they didn't have parkas, they didn't like the idea of parkas, so the backs of their necks were always exposed, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into too much more about that. Um, but, but Cherry's description in the first part of his book of that first season, spring, summer, fall, is um, weirdly like maybe the, uh, uh, the Keystone cops combined with some horrible nightmare. They killed seven of the 17 ponies by accident. They were lucky they didn't die themselves in crevasses or falling into the sea. And, and it, it was simply a, when that winter began, there was reason for many of them to be quite worried in their private diaries. And I do want to point out the basics here. Scott had promised Wilson his uh, second in command, and Wilson was an ornithologist and interested in the emperor penguins that lived here at Cape Crozier, right here against the sea ice. And Wilson had even spent two months in 1902 camped there studying them. But he was there in the summertime, and what he found out was the emperor penguins um, uh, ha laid their eggs in exactly the middle of the winter. So um, if he was going to get fresh emperor penguin eggs, which he wanted for reasons I'll explain later, he had to be there in midwinter. And so when they came down in, in 1910, they intended to camp here, set their hut here. It didn't work. There's cliffs, there's a, um, uh, the Ross ice shelf, unstable, uh, various instabilities and big waves. And so they uh, came around here in 1902, they had been down here at Hut Point, which is now McMurdo Station and Scott Station, Scott Base, the Kiwi Base, and the American Base at McMurdo is right there where Scott had his party in 1902. Wilson was there, Shackleton was there. Um, that was uh, blocked off by ice, and so Shackleton had set a camp here which enraged Scott because Scott had claimed the entirety of this side of Ross Island as being his in a kind of a race, speaking of Victorian structures of feeling. And Shackleton had agreed that he would try to camp elsewhere, but this was the only one he could find, so he camped there. Well, they didn't want to go where Shackleton had set his camp, so they went right here, Camp Evans, a little piece of bare land. And we'll talk more about this bare land later. So they were here. And that will be the kind of grounding for our adventure at the winter solstice, week after, June 27th of 1911, in full darkness, 24 hours a day, which is going to last for the next three months or so. Uh, three of them began here, traveled down to here, and then over to here and back. That's Wilson, Henry Bowers, and our uh, Cherry. So... Um, See what we got next. This is the ship that brought them to Cape Evans. So you, I want to get you, in terms of uh, different uh, types of technologies, this is what got them there. And of course, there had to be open water. This was not an icebreaker by any means. It was another clapped out old piece of equipment that they had bought on the cheap. It, its main job had been as a coal hauler on the east side of England. So it almost uh, sank on the way there. They had to go through immense heroics in a storm to keep it from sinking outright. They had to cut through a metal wall in the middle of the storm in order to get pumped down to the correct part of the bilge. This is the Cape Evans hut. And so that's about 50 feet by 25 feet. And inside it, the 25 men were wintering over. This is a view from above of the bay at Cape Evans and the kind of bare ground that Cape Evans is involved in. Um, and this is uh, the group, uh, or the officers of the group, because the, the, the interior of the cabin was split by boxes of supplies between the able seamen and the officers, and the able seamen didn't come through the little doorway into the officers' quarters. So this is officers' quarters, and we have here, oh, sorry. Um, this is Cherry right here. Um, there's Scott. There's Wilson. There's Bertie Bowers. He was named for his nose, Bertie, nickname, Henry Bowers. 
And uh, this is Teddy Evans, who became an admiral in World War II and was universally disliked by everybody on, in this entire crowd. It's rather <laughs> astonishing. Uh, he's a story in itself. Another picture of a different party. You notice the flags are gone in the background. And here we have uh, Bertie again over here on the left. But also, again, Evans, Scott, and Wilson. I suspect that's where they were, that was their place at the head of the table as the three major officers. Back at the other end of the table, this is all the same room. This was the bedroom. This is Cherry down here. This is Bowers, who slept above him. This is Titus Oates, who said, I'm going out in maybe some time. And this is uh, Mears and, and uh, Atkinson, scientists. That's what it looks like now. Same space, same table, same beds. Now, this is oh, supposedly Cherry's stuff, his wall of pictures, beautiful young Victorian ladies, uh, one of them rather scantily clad with an upright cobra in front of her, um, which, you know, this is pre-Freud, and so it's just kind of a crack up. Um, and this is Bowers's, in all dogs. You gotta love it. And this is on the shelf there, and I only saw this looking through my slides, although, no, I must have seen it at the time. Equality, D, Be that must be Edward Bellamy. There was some utopian literature down there in their camp. Edward Bellamy, our, our American uh, looking backward from the year 2000. And I'm not surprised because this little hut was indeed a little pocket utopia of uh, otherworldly young British men trying to be scientists or heroes of one kind or another. That's the table that the previous photos were with. Still there, and there's a leak in the ceiling. You can see it's drifting frost down in two places. The laboratory is over here. Ponting's dark room was at the back for photos. Over here to the left of this red spot was a private bedroom for Scott and for Wilson, who slept in two beds beside each other. There's Robert Scott at his bed and desk. There's my good friend Buck Tilly at the same place in 1995. And indeed, when we showed, I showed these slides to a crowd down at McMurdo in 2016, and when the environmental safety officer and, you know, keeper of the goods saw this slide, he was so appalled that we had sat down on one of the chairs there that he, he almost blew up right in front of me. <laughs> um, this is what it looks like now, and this dead emperor penguin has been there for perhaps 60 years. No one knows why. I think uh, Kiwis left it there on a pass-through years ago, but it's always there, and because the temperature never goes above freezing, you know, it's just permanently frozen there. This is very common shelf. There were 11,000 items left inside the Cape Evans hut, and so the um, New Zealand Antarctic Heritage Trust has had a grand time restoring, and they've done an incredible job because it's one of their favorite things to take care of these places. And the, God knows what's in these things, but one of the bottles says poison, um, just that's the only label is just poison. <laughs> um, this is um, a stove canister. I mean, this is stove fuel canister. And on the winter journey, they took six of these uh, on the sledges that you're going to shortly see. And they had used five of them by the time they got to Cape Crozier, which always struck me as a little nervy um, to use five sixths of your fuel on the trip out. I was thinking, I kept thinking, what are they thinking, you know, about the trip home? Um, but, but that's still there in the camp. And then as a kind of monument, I think, or a great objective correlative to their uh, inability to adjust to Antarctica because of their, um, you, I mean, God knows how to even say it. This is a pony snowshoe. So the ponies were supposed to be wearing snowshoes to help them on the ice. And of course, they didn't do a thing. Um, while they were out and about, there were always Weddell seals on the ice around Cape Evans. And so these served uh, not as food, they don't taste very well, and they had canned food, but fuel. They burned the blubber of these beasts. So they would go out and club a few of these beasts, chop them up, and then turn their fat into fuel for the fire. Because they had, of course, no wood, and they couldn't bring their own fuel. So these things were, this is a mama, a, a child. You see that a lot. They grow up fast, I want to say that. 
So be careful, mamas of the world, because that's still a mama and baby there uh, nursing. Um, skuas, the most vicious seagulls on the planet. Uh, and this is, this is a friendly exchange. This is a male doing a courtship thing for a very unimpressed female. Um, very, very cool. And this is the view across McMurdo Sound, which is almost always frozen. Um, and that's the Royal Society range, about 60 or 70 miles away. But the clarity of the air down there means that everything always looks closer than it really is. Oh, that's me taking a photo. There's always penguins. And that's Mount Erebus in the background. And this is the view if you look back into the island from Cape Evans. So this is Bill Wilson. And as an ornithologist, uh, he had ideas about what he wanted. Um, and so he said, let's see if I've still got that. He, want, he was. Uh, he wanted to be like Darwin or Wallace and make a scientific discovery. He was also the artist. I'll use his artwork. He was the steadiest guy. He was Scott's friend, but he was also everybody's friend and the one that everybody relied on. He was about 38. Uh, at, in fact, his 38th birthday was during the storm at Cape Crozier. Um, and everybody loved him. And so the, the Roland Hunford, the biographer of Scott and Amazon, who, who uh, grew into a terrifically irrational hatred of Scott and a persecutor of Scott, he was the great uh, revisionist historian who brought Scott's reputation down. This is in the 1980s. And so he, he disliked Wilson, too, because Wilson was too good. And, but he was a good person. And he had um, the idea that penguins were a primitive form of bird because they were flightless, thinking that it had gone from primitive forms of bird to um, uh, more advanced forms of bird. It, it, that's evolutionarily backwards. We now generally think that flightless birds were flighted birds first and evolved backwards from that. But this was the science of the time. And then there was also, OK, so these are emperor and penguins uh, who were of particular interest to him. And those are his drawings of them. And this is why he was interested. It's heckle, right? It's phylogeny recapitulates. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which also turns out to be wrong. And indeed, heckle is now accused of, of faking some of these drawings of his. But the idea would be that if you got an early embryo of an emperor penguin, it might have teeth like an ar ar Archeropteryx. And it might even have scales instead of feathers on its passage through to being a bird uh, from the dinosaur stage. And so these drawings were inspirational to Wilson. And he wanted to get a penguin that would be at that same stage and prove something deep and fundamental back in the world of science. And these are the three eggs that they recovered from Cape Crozier by their incredible winter journey. Um, they're still in a natural history museum somewhere in England. And they have been carefully opened up. And that's one of the poor embryo penguins that uh, it turns out was a little bit to a few weeks too. Even if, the, even if those theories had been true, this is a little bit too developed for what Wilson really wanted. So um, the winter journey, they, they, they went from, as I said, from here around the tip of this island and over to here to Cape Crozier. Just another, this is a modern satellite picture of it. And their plan was, when they got to the Cape Crozier side there, they were going to build a rock hut. It was going to be, uh, this is Wilson's own drawing of it. So the three of them would sleep side by side. This would be the windward side uh, facing south. This would be the door end. And the door would be like that. They brought a piece of wood as a lintel so that the canvas that was going to cover this thing, they brought the canvas also, would wrap around the wood so that it wouldn't be flapping in the opening there. So they, they were, and this would be one of the two sleds would be emptied and used as a roof beam. A nine feet sled section, I think, um, you know, this was the whole plan with rocks like this and moraine and gravel and then ice slabs with more rocks and anchor stone, all very elaborate. Um, now, question becomes, why 
They had Scott tents. They still use them in Antarctica. This was my tent in 95 on, on Shackleton Glacier, and Scott tents are all over. They're still used all the time. I think this was the Scott tent that we used on Robert's Massif, um, and, and we, we slept in these individual tents and meant in this one in order to have dinner. It was kind of the dining tent, and they are uh, reliable and strong in wind. That's their main feature. So um, uh, I think that Wilson thought effectively, these are Wilson's own sketches of what it's like to operate in a Scott tent. They're hard to get in and out of, and clearly he thought they were pretty crowded. This is one of his cutaways. And this is another one at night. And he needed lab space to do the work on these penguin eggs that he was going to recover. So the notion would be they would sleep in the rock hut and they would be able to burn blubber. Again, penguin blubber would be like seal blubber and burn that for fuel in the rock hut and then use the Scott tent as their lab in order to work on pickle, to pickle some embryos to get them back to London without them degenerating. So that was the plan. And here they are taking off. Um, Bowers on the left, Wilson in the middle, Cherry on the right. The, the, the stacked uh, sled behind them, and, and with the tent, the Scott tent on top, with bamboo poles, which is, amazes me they're that strong. Um, and I think the reason that they didn't take two Scott, hut, uh, Scott tents was simply weight. That the Scott tent is about, especially when it gets a little icy, is about 100 pounds. Each one of these sleds was 380 pounds, so you add another 100 pounds to that, it's a pretty significant weight that you would only use out at Cape Crozier. So I think the rock hut, which is a crucial part of my story here because of the, the fortuitous discovery that I made on my trip down there in 2016, the rock hut was Wilson and Cherry and Bowers' clever method for um, uh, having two spaces once they got there. Now, I, I, just to say a word about Bowers, um, so Sherry, at some point in later years, calls him an ugly little fellow. Um, he was a, 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 in the Indian Royal Marines, and he was about, I don't know, 5'5". Five, five. He was by far the strongest man on the expedition. He was also the only one that could understand the logistical schemas of Scott and took over Scott's logistics and rationalized them because Scott was an inveterately confused person. And, and Bowers was very good at logistics. He also wrote hilarious Kipling-esque poetry about even the winter journey itself. So Bowers was really quite an accomplished character, and he never got cold and he never got tired. He was 28 at the time, Cherry was 24, and Wilson was 38. So um, these are Wilson's drawings. This is what it's like to pull. This is probably what they look like. Notice those single ski poles. And they were pulling the two sleds linked together. As they crossed that area south of Ross Island, here's their map of it, sometimes they would make only one mile a day because the snow was so cold it did not cohere and was like sand. So they were dragging 380-pound sleds through a sub snow that was like sand. Sometimes they'd drag one sled a mile, go back to the other one, grab that one, and pull it up. And we're in fear, because it was all dark the entire time, that if the wind came up, they might get caught having lost one sled or another or both and, and end up in a disaster. So they were running around like crazy people. It took them 19 days to go 35 miles out here to Crozier, and this is a, a Cherry's map, but it was based on Wilson's map, because one of the things about Cherry was that his vision was way worse than mine, like 2,500, his glasses fogged up, and he effectively did this entire expedition as a blind person. Um, and when they got out here, um, the first person to get back to their hut 40 years later was Sir Edmund Hillary on a tractor expedition from Scott Base, they used this map to try to find the rock hut. And although the stone hut is marked as right here, right next to the knoll, its real position is about where the E is on moraine. So they didn't even know where they were. But of course, it was dark, and they had no maps of any kind of accuracy. Um, but this is, this is really what happened to them. 
So this is what the emperor penguins at night look like. Again, Wilson's drawing, and they managed to make it down a 200-foot cliff, grab some eggs, get back up the cliff to the rock hut, build the rock hut in the dark. And the problem is this. This island, Erebus is a live volcano about 12,000 feet high. Terror is about 9,000 feet high. It's a, it's a ridge between the two. The wind always comes from the south, uh, falling off of the polar cap, a catabatic wind, 10,000 feet high. The air just falls off the edge and it flows north. The long and short of it is that the reason these places are dark is the wind has blown away the snow. These are two of the windiest places on Earth because the wind's always flowing and then it hits this wall and it gets compressed around the two sides. So you can, by, by accident and not knowing it, they had camped about right here. First rock they came to, because they needed to build a rock hut, and of course it was a ridge, and of course it was rock because the wind had blown away all the snow, also all the sand that they needed to fill the gaps between their stones, and they had camped at one of the windiest places on Earth. Hillary was amazed. He called it unenviable. <laughs> so this is Wilson's drawing of what happened there. They're up there on that rock top, and um, he and he and Cherry always claimed, well, we put it in the lee, we should have been okay, but of course, even his own drawing shows that it's only marginally the lee. And uh, for Wilson to call it the sly wind of blizzards is funny because, um, well, there's the ridge. And so you can see that the wind has done this, and they had to, they're coming along this way, the, their, their penguins are over to the left, they needed to build a rock hut as soon as possible. 19 days gone, completely exhausted, frozen, and used up five of their six cans of stove fuel. And here they are when they got back, because they did get back. Even though a, a wind, a hurricane hit that the Wilson and Bowers who had naval experience rated as Beaufort 11, which means basically hurricane force winds, perhaps 75 miles an hour, it hit them. It blew away their Scott tent, and I'm not aware of any Scott tent ever being blown away before in, in the entire record of Antarctica. And that tent being gone, they were doomed on their way back home. And then it blew away their canvas sheet and blew it to smithereens and knocked down the rocks on top of them, and they were suddenly exposed to the gale with a tiny little rock wall in their sleeping bags for 48 hours. They survived that. They pulled their act together. They took one sled. They left everything else. They got back home, and this is Ponting's photo, and I quite love it. I've written about it before. Wilson is aware that he got lucky and he almost killed his friends. Cherry suffered from depression and post-traumatic stress disorder for the rest of his life. And Bowers is like, well, that was cool. <laughs> Let's do it again. And indeed, all three of them did it again. Two months later, they were on their way to the South Pole even though they had had a 36-day adventure that would have been uh, completely crippling, uh, and certainly they were not recovered from it when they went south again. That's me and uh, my friend Buck trying to reproduce. Unfortunately, I set the focus wrong, but we did our best, and we certainly enraged the uh, environmental protection officer. So let's change gears. This is what it's like to uh, get to Antarctica now, uh, technologically, into a very much different period, the postmodern period. Uh, so you fly in on a C5, it looks like that on the inside. Or if they don't have any gear, it looks like that on the inside. It's very surrealistic. That's McMurdo, seen as you're flying into it. Um, the lab, the dorms, the galley. Um, there's nothing here that predates 1956, except for the Discovery Hut is right over here. You can't quite see it, but that was Scott's first spot in 1902. Um, that's looking from above, and better I can show you, the Discovery Hut is right there. It's a good place to come in. And this is from up on Observation Hill. So this is my helper and guide, Elaine Hood. She took me these various places. And our trip, my trip in 2016 was vastly complicated by this man, John F. Kerry, Secretary of State. Awesome, he says, <laughs> or maybe amazing. Um, and getting him to the various places he needed to see was completely disruptive of my own trip. 
So uh, weirdly, I first went to Cape Crozier on a, on a lucky stroke with a free helicopter for a couple hours, and the very next day I went to Cape Evans, and I'm going to tell you the story in that order. Um, this is what McMurdo is like. You get signs like this. Um, you get, you know, the Bernie voters are already aware. The class system at McMurdo is extremely exposed. The scientists still wear red jackets with their names on the lapels, and the support staff still wears tan Carhartts with small, medium, large, and extra large in the very same spot that the names go. So NSF is not real canny when it comes to clash issues. The support staff all call the scientists beakers from the Muppets. Um, and I got to tell you, I don't like traveling in helicopters. I've only done it in Antarctica, and there's crashed helicopters and portraits of dead people on the walls of the uh, warehouses at McMurdo that died in helicopter crashes, and they're very unlikely vehicles. So that's me in a helicopter. <laughs> and in the helicopter, you see that the pilot has to look at this stuff. And you see that he's got a checklist just to take off. This is a guy who's been flying helicopters for 30 years, and he knows he needs a checklist. And the signs are a little alarming. You're thinking, really? This is for the pilot to remember. And that's kind of obvious. But um, when you're in the air, this is the kind of thing you get to see. So there is a, the technological sublime. This is an old slide from 1995. And in 1995, I was on a helicopter trip to go out to Cape Crozier, and it was too windy to land. A rather officious uh, New Zealand Air Force lieutenant was flying around in a World War II Huey helicopter, and he didn't want to land because it was too windy. And this is sort of what wind looks like at Cape Crozier. Um, there's the shore that's hard to get to. There's another shot. There's we had to land, and you can sort of see the wind. And we, and we took all our stuff out. And we walked up the hill to this hut for penguin hunters. And we spent like 40 hours in this hut waiting for the wind to go down before we could fly back to McMurdo. So in 95, I did not get to see the Cape Crozier hut, even though I was intensely interested. So um, this time, pilot, Harlan Blake, cool guy, and way more experienced and older than the officious young Kiwi pilot of 25 years earlier. And this is what it looked like flying out there. Again, Erebus. Very extremely surreal and gorgeous and bizarre. And finally, we began to approach Cape Crozier, which is out there. And we began to fly around, saying, where's the rock hut? And we had GPS, but you know, GPS from the air in a wind. Again, it was really, really windy. And I thought, oh god, we're not going to be able to land. It's just the way it is. So we flew around, going, where is that rock hut? And we couldn't see it, we couldn't see it, we couldn't see it. We thought, well, that should be what they now call Igloo Spur, and it's the first one, and they did desperately go to the first one, and then we saw it, and we had to circle around again to it and see it there, see why it's hard to see, and see where the wind is coming up compressed and hitting it and then flying things off. So we came around again, and Harlan said, oh, I can land it. I just can't stop the rotors because that might be destabilizing. So I'll land, and I'll keep the rotors going, and you guys do what you need to do. And Elaine and I hopped out, and Elaine was immediately knocked over by the wind. And yet, there I was. And Elaine just stuck herself in one spot and took photos of me. There's the helicopter. The wind was so loud going over this ridge, we could not hear that helicopter. We couldn't hear each other shouting in each other's ears. So it was a matter of sign language and wandering in a wind that was, um, Harlan said his gauge had it at about 60 miles an hour. And it felt a lot worse, and I wonder if the compression issues are involved with that or not. So there's me facing the wind, taking pictures of the, this is the remains of the rock hut at Cape Crozier. Um, I was looking around for stuff in the interior and seeing also gaps between the stones that the wind just flew right through on these guys. Um, and then this is it. This is, Bertie Bowers got the rocks from up here, made, and they brought it down, and then Wilson and, and Cherry made the ring. But they had no sand whatsoever that could be moved or wedged to fill in between the rocks. So um, this is looking down on it from the little thing above. There's some stuff inside, the canvas that burst. And also, happily, I thought, well, these are dead emperor penguin skins flayed by the wind. But I think that's the lintel. 
That's the, the piece of wood they used to block their doorway, still in there. And there it is. That's the rock hut at Cape Crozier. And um, I recognize that look on my face by the feeling in my face. But I've never seen it in a photo before, uh, a sense of joy. I was having the time of my life. I, I, I couldn't believe it, that I'd finally got there, that it was real, the story was real. And um, it was truly one of the high points of my life. I think we were there for about between 10 and 15 minutes. And at that point, we were icicles, and, and we got back in the helicopter and left. And this was the view on the way home. I have to say, between the reality of the past and the technological sublime, this is Observation Hill, and McMurdo's down here, and Scott Bass is down here. This view lasted for about an hour, and I don't think the um, Royal Society range is actually that tall. So um, the thermal inversion layer that day was flipping it and making it look taller than it really was. A supreme moment for me. The next day, Elaine had me on a snowmobile. I don't know how to drive a snowmobile, but it turns out there's nothing to it. Um, and we followed this flag line out to Cape Evans, back to Cape Evans. This is what it looked like in 95. It's quite beautiful. And I immediately went to Cherry's Practice Hut. And this is my discovery. The Antarctic Heritage Trust of New Zealand has a little guide to all of the sites that they take care of. And for Cape Evans, they have 11 points of interest. And the 11th point simply said, Cherry's Practice Hut. I said, what? I've never heard of it. It's not in the literature at all, except for that one mention. So I wrote to the uh, David Harrowfield, the Dean of Antarctic uh, Historians in New Zealand, and I said, what's with that? And he said, oh, yes. Uh, Cherry built that uh, two months before they, uh, they left, and he immediately sent me the references to it. One of the scientists uh, in May says, Cherry puts in the day typing copy for the South Polar Times or building a stone hut in which to flend seal skins. And then Wilson writes home, Cherry is building a stone hut close to the main hut for seal skinning. And this is Wilson. That can't be right. And then Scott says, Cherry Garrard is building a stone house for taxidermy, as if they did that, when with a view to getting hints for making a shelter at Cape Crozier during the winter. Aha. Wilson had to have told Scott what he was up to, his plans. And so Scott wrote it down. It's the only evidence that we have. This is just, well, that's me taking a picture of it. But that's how far it is from the main hut. Nobody notices it. Nobody mentions it. And yet, there it is. And it's in perfect shape. It's the platonic ideal of the hut that they had in mind. Because Cherry had like two months to build it. He had daylight. It was relatively warm like from zero to 20 below, and he had a ton of sand. And what you'll notice, there's a picture of uh, Elaine to give you scale and where it is, is that he's filled in the cracks between the stones with sand like, a, like mortar, such that the reason that the snow is so smooth across the top of this thing is there's no wind coming through these walls. They have been uh, uh, cemented, but without, in a drywall kind of format. So Cherry, this is it, his practice hut, um, his masterpiece. And I have to tell you that after having seen the, the wreck at Cape Crozier the day before, this was an intensely moving thing to see. It's what they had wanted out there that they couldn't manage to build because they didn't have the time. So I want to, this is Elaine trying to get a hero shot for her purposes at NSF. But from here you can see there's his practice hut. There's that. And the reason, if, if I had known to look 24 years before or 21 years before, it was probably snowed over when I was there in 95 and invisible to anybody seeing it, which I only noticed putting together this slideshow. And not that I would have even known what it was, because it's very innocuous. So um, Sir Edmund Hillary, when he came by in the 1950s, the stone hut, he found it at last. There were a hundred items of Victorian science left in, behind in the hut, but leaving behind a thermos was a mistake. They were in the dark. They had been blasted by a hurricane. They were panicked. There was snow on their sleeping bag and everything else. They were getting out of there while they could. I have to add that their tent that blew away, 
they found at the bottom of the hill. It was a miracle that saved their lives. It had folded up like an umbrella and gotten into a crack between two boulders. So um, uh, Cherry says, we were so relieved we said nothing. <laughs> and um, there is one of their thermometers. It goes from 60 above to 60 below. And that's why in certain temperatures, although they had many thermometers being Victorians, um, this would bottom out and they would have temperatures that other thermometers would show where they got to 77 below zero Fahrenheit on that trip. And so these are all in a museum in Canterbury and this is the sled that was left on the rock hut that was their roof for that period of time. Hillary brought it back. It used to be in a storeroom. It used to be an exhibit. I mean, many years have passed. This is like 20 feet up a wall in the Canterbury Museum, and these other sleds are meaningless. So it's stupid, and I remonstrated with the ex uh, curators at the museum, and they said, you know, it's definitely stupid. The whole exhibit is stupid. We're keeping it that way so that we get some money to redo the whole thing. But uh, Christchurch has just been completely devastated by two giant earthquakes, so that is not going to happen anytime soon. So quickly, the South Pole that spring, Scott took up a party of 16, and every couple, a week or so, he sent back a party of four. He had these incredibly complicated logistics to leave depots, to get up to the pole with four people, and get back with those four people going depot to depot. Cherry went up, and he was sent back in the second team, very disappointed. Bowers and Wilson were there in the last group, and at the last moment, Scott decided to take five people to the pole rather than the four which completely devastated his logistical scheme and was probably the main reason they got killed on the way home. Scott, it's no wonder that Hunford ended up with a, a, a visceral dislike of Scott because he was really quite a terrible expedition leader in many ways. So Cherry was in the group that went out and found the bodies the following spring. He had had to window over a second winter, try to recover his health. They all knew that their friends were dead. In the spring, they went south. They found a tent inside the tent Scott, Wilson, Bowers. And there were two more that had Oates and, and uh, Seaman Evans back up the way. So this they put up before they left in 1913, this cross. And speaking of that particular structure of feeling, it's, uh, the lines are from Tennyson. It says, in memoriam, and underneath it, it says, um, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. And then all the names of the five who died. So you have. Dr. E.A. Wilson, Lieutenant H.R. Bowers. And uh, I know Cherry was involved with the putting up of this post up there. And then he went home, home to England and World War I. So he joined the Auxiliary Corps and had a horrific health problems. He drove ambulances like Tolkien and Stapleton, drove ambulances until the ulcerative colitis and general nervous distress drove him back home and he was invalided out. But he spent time in, in World War I behind the trenches. And beautifully, he was given the uh, task of writing the official account of the expedition. He couldn't do it. Uh, it seemed ridiculous to him, and he was overdetermined by the people trying to uh, encourage him to give an official report with all the facts and figures. And he refused and took the book back. Uh, and. His next door neighbor out in the country, rich as he was, was George Bernard Shaw. And this is quite beautiful. They became good friends, and Shaw was his editor. As Pound was to Eliot with The Wasteland, which also appeared in 22, Shaw was to the worst journey in the world. It's not an accident that that book is as good as it is. It really shows the uh, really a uh, fine mind of Shaw as a guiding spirit to catch the right tone. And Sherry's tone in this book is consistently interesting. Um, he had to um, deal with double binds. Essentially, at this point, after World War I, he was in a different period. He was in a different structure of feeling. And he's looking back across the war to what happened before. He calls it sometimes um, some centuries ago, it seems, when Scott was in the Antarctic, or he says, an age in geologic time, and he's talking about 10 years. Uh, and the double bind was severe. He wanted to um, be loyal to Scott, but he was intensely angry at Scott for killing his real friends, Wilson and Bowers. 
and he was permanently in post-traumatic stress disorder, as we would call it now. And it took him about four years of writing the book. And without Shaw's um, wise help, Shaw was 30 years older, but they were good friends. Uh, I'm not sure the book would have turned out the way it did. I see the mark of a smart editor there. This, by the way, is, uh, oh, this is Scott's, this is Scott's widow, Kathleen, and the son, Peter Scott, that, um, that um, Robert Scott never saw. So, uh, Cherry wrote his book, it came out in 22, it was instantly regarded as a classic because under the enormous pressure of trying to reconcile the two structures of feeling, his youth and his um, middle age, his enthusiasm as a kid, his depression as an adult, and his double bind to tell the truth but not tell the truth, it, the book could have splintered and been a mess or it could get compressed to a kind of a diamond of British fine writing. Um, Anglo-Saxon, plain, kind of a dark irony, often pretty funny, uh, and, and well phrased sentence by sentence. A very beautiful memorial to his friend, and that was all he really did with his life, except sell off parts of his estate and, and complain about the Labor Party, and, 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 be, and suffer through bouts of depression. But at age 53, he married this young woman, Angela, who at that point was 23, and he had 20 years of a relatively happy, uh, and I say relatively, she was great, the marriage was great, he still suffered from breakdowns from time to time, and in World War II had a psychotic break and thought Germans were in the attic and had to be, go through uh, a, a, essentially a lifetime of psychiatric treatment. So, cool, I'm actually coming to the end and what I want to say here, the things that he wrote in his old age, in the long run, no man can escape himself. Or this is for an um, obituary for Lashley, one of the able seamen who was in the hut and on the big hikes, um, knowing you can't go on and going on all the same. Well, this is like 20 years before Beckett's can't go on, must go on. So this is a modernist at this point. And a, and a deeply impacted modernist who had a Victorian youth. Um, it's an incredible story. And I guess you maybe will guess how I want to pull it into the topic of this conference is, um, so we're living in 1911, okay? It's come again. We're at the end of a period and the end of a particular structure of feeling. And in the next five, 10, 20, or 30 years, there, people alive then, which will include many of you, um, will be on in a different period and in a different structure of feeling. And when you look back to now, it's gonna be like people in 1935 looking back to 1911. And that will be interesting to see if you can negotiate that as gracefully and less depressedly as Cherry did in his own trauma and his own attempt to cope with it. Um, the, the new age will, I guess, be, it's, I'm not talking about the Anthropocene here because as we all know, the Anthropocene can be tagged or not tagged any time in the last couple thousand years. People have their favorite golden spike moments, etc. I guess I'm talking about the post-carbon era, the accommodation to the planet to avoid um, a civilizational crash and a mass extinction event. An accommodation will be made and that world will be post-carbon. It'll have its own name. I don't know what it'll be. It'll feel different. And looking back to this time will feel strange. This is what I'm thinking. And this is my way of trying to come to a conclusion. And as a final image, it just occurred to me looking at these slides last night. And you know, I was an English major brought up in uh, the new, new criticism. I was brought up before theory existed. The objective correlative was a very important thing to us. And that's Eliot, right? The practice hut that Cherry built, so perfect, so platonic ideal, uh, with leisure to do it right. That's the 1911. And then the blasted thing out there on Cape Crozier is what comes as the trauma. And the question is, 
can you rebuild that wreck on Cape Corrosion after it's been blown up, especially if it's dark and windy and there's no sand? Not at all certain that we can do that. So th I now think of these two huts and the incredible practice hut that was so moving to me. Well, they both were, but in such different ways. It's, it's an interesting objective correlative for the, 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 the period that we're now facing, the transition, et cetera. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time, I think, for a good uh, 20 minutes of, of questioning. Um, nice, vibrant audience. So ideally, we would invite people to line up up here so that people online can see them. Um, so but I'm not really Yikes. sure how many people are online at this point. So I'm also willing to sort of walk around. But why don't you, yeah. Do you want to come up or? Do you mind actually panning the camera, Jesse? Would you do that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. That was really a pleasure. Um, I'm really interested in uh, and compelled by the idea of this platonic ideal of the practice hut. Um, and since so much of what we're thinking through at this conference is often about literature and um, writing and, and, and the environment, I'm wondering you know, if there's connections you're seeing um, between this idea of this platonic ideal of the practice hut that's maybe kind of isolated from some of these other environmental factors where the, the wind isn't at the same um, strength and they're, they're not exposed to all these elements in the same way, um, and the sort of imagined environments of uh, different types of writing. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking, of course, of your own writing and the imagined environments that you've uh, speculated in a lot of your work, um, and just sort of the, if you could just speak on those sort of connections of the platonic ideal, literary form, and uh, environmental elements. Well, thank you for that, because the reason I'm smiling is, and, and um, those of you, and there's really only one of you who've read my new novel, which isn't out yet and is only in draft, <laughs> is, is, the, um, is the wrecked hut. It's... Hmm. It's been blown up. The novel, I had to blow up the novel. It's a wreck, this book. And, I, and uh, when I gave up on trying to make sense of it was the only way that I could complete it. So um, yeah, it's an interesting thought. I, mean, I just, uh, the notion of the, hut is, of the two huts as objective correlative just occurred to me last night. Uh, so I haven't yet done much thinking on it, but I did say to a couple of people, and finishing this latest novel, oh, I, I blew up the house on my departure from the house. And so it, it kind of fits with that image. So thank you for that. Now I can, maybe that should be the cover of the new book, The, the Blasted Hut. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so thank you so much for that. That was fabulous and uh, really thought-provoking in you know, a multiplicity of directions. Um, I'm just curious because you know, as an art historian, when we think about the Arctic, at least right now, we're thinking a lot about, um, I don't know if you've read uh, Christopher Hewer's uh, book that came out last year, Into the White. No. Um, but basically what Hewer is engaging with is how the sort of is it the pandemic? Is it here? No. <laughs> um, but, um, but how the sort of vast landscape of the Arctic really explodes our expectations for sort of any matrix of visual representation in the arts. And I'm, I'm just sort of curious, I guess, in terms of the specificity of the media that you're working with in terms of verbal representation. I mean, how has your time spent in these spaces affected your engagement with um, you know, any number of like, issues or fields of relationality that sort of may or may not take their points of departure from your time spent in these spaces or not? Thank you for that. I, it's definitely had an impact. 
And I think that the Antarctic it, it makes a uh, particular problem for both uh, any artist, writers, uh, I've seen it with photographers and with painters, and as a member of the Antarctic Artists and Writers Program, I actually traveled with a, a, a photographer and artist pair, and I paid a lot of attention to it. There are people who have gone down there and been um, stunned to a blankness by the Antarctic. And in my novel, Antarctica, I had my artist Tashu um, uh, go down there as a kind of Ginsbergian or Whitmanian type long-winded poet. And there are Chinese poets that were like that in the long tradition. And he comes back with four word poems, blue sky, white ice, white sky, blue ice. And there's a, maybe 10 or 12 four word poems to express Antarctica. And after that, he goes silent, like Beckett or, or even Silender, and doesn't write anymore. And uh, there's a photographer I, I met, uh, no, I, I saw his work, a student Hallowell down there trying to get the long, blank perspectives of the Antarctic in quite stunning photographs, but they would have to have been as wide as this room and only this high. And he never got that book published. Um, and it goes on and on like that. Um, it, it, Francis Spufford is very good in his book, I May Be Some Time, about the aesthetics of this problem and the, the, the um, changing structures of feeling for British um, explorers and artists going north and south. And um, The Ice by Stephen Pine, um, a, an American who went down there and did a, a study of the aesthetics of it, is very good on this issue as well. I'd be interested in the new book, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it came to the same conclusions, that you, uh, you have to give up on ideas of beauty. Uh, Cherry was not an aesthetician, and so he said, well, two beautiful places on Earth, England and Antarctica. And I can explain England, but I can't explain Antarctica, but if you were to live at Hut Point for a month, you'd know what I mean. So there's the inexpressible. Um, and I think you have to go to the theory of the sublime. It's not beautiful, it's sublime. And it's classic Burkean sublime. It's a combination of beauty and terror. And the terror, you know, when you're in a helicopter is severe. Um, but, but even just looking at it and knowing that you could die in an hour um, adds the terror element. And so it's very a visceral sense of the sublime. And that's an interesting space, but very hard to represent in any kind of art. So thank you so much. This was really amazing. Uh, one of the things that struck me as I was watching um, the slides and listening to your talk was the contrast between the sublime of the ice and the mountain that looked even taller and all of that, the pristine quality mm. of the slides, but also the pristine quality of the ice when um, Cherry was doing his uh, uh, the drawings. I, was it Cherry who was doing it was, the? Uh, Wilson's. Wilson's, Wilson's sorry. drawings, yes. Um, and then. The, the remains of the hut, which were amazing in their own way. And then some of the modern pictures that you showed of the growing development, which looked like litter. Mm -hmm. And when you showed the uh, museums, well, not the museums, but the preservation of all the detritus left behind, I couldn't help thinking about how there is a kind of narrative that we put on this that's about endurance, about... Which, and I'm not suggesting that it's false, I'm just saying that there is a narrative that cleans it up. And there is the brutality of the experience that they had to experience. And then the brutality of our more modern experience that is a brutality perhaps on the land. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you feel that we, the, the structures that we're leaving behind, will they be experienced in the same way? Can they be experienced in the same way? would they still have the sense of human endeavor attached to it, or we will just look at it and say, hey, carbon era, litter? It's a good question. Um, you, you see, when you go to the Cape Heaven site where they live for three years, the sand around it is completely covered with rusty nails and broken ceramic and junk. So there was litter right from the get-go. Um, and indeed the 110 objects out there at the rock hut. These, these guys had a lot of junk and they, and they tossed left and right as they passed on their way. But certainly in the modern dispensation, we've managed to double or triple down on that. 
Uh, South Pole Station, the original one, is now about 20 or 30 feet under the ice and it's being crushed by the weight of the ice over it. And you crawl into it and you see bizarre 1950s detritus, but it's going away. Um, the old station, at um, the dome station that superseded it at South Pole got lifted out and is out in a field in Oregon. And the one that's there now is a kind of um, blue-sided, solar-paneled, um, modernist artwork, quite a wonderful piece of, of uh, architecture, and yet it's form-following function. It's only built that way to keep it from being buried in its turn. It's up on stilts, it's solar-collecting, it's a nice uh, building. And so different things will happen in different spaces. To a certain extent, the nations that go down there, the, the other European nations have built uh, uh, Antarctic stations that are like architectural charrettes, where every building is a, is a work of art. And Bjarke Engels is you know, uh, often involved with these things. It's a, so it's a, now an opportunity. And in the postmodern space, you can't really guess what will happen. But the brutality. Well, they put up a nuclear plant right there, a power plant, at McMurdo in, in, in 62 and pulled it out in 72 and then had to take many uh, thousands of cubic um, um, feet, thousands and thousands, uh, out on ships to um, the, the nuclear dump in South Carolina to clean up the landscape there. And they have had so much... Um, McMurdo is such a, a ramshackle ad hoc architecture of put up a building here, put up a building there, there's never a plan, that they're actually thinking of leveling most of it and replacing it with one giant like Walmart warehouse, which would be better thermally, but would be ridiculous in human terms compared to the, the little warrens that people want to crawl into in McMurdo. The bar is like you can barely stand up in, and, and it's and it goes on like that. The stuff from 1956 now seems more human scale. And the stuff that would replace it, that would be more architecturally beautiful and more, uh, func uh, more uh, functional in, in thermal terms, in energy terms, is a, like an airport. And, and even the, if you think of Antarctica and you're an Antarctican and you think that the meeting hall or the dining room would look like this room, there's a, a visceral reaction, oh no, we, we come down here actually to get back into a village. There's 1,000 people there in the summer, there's 200 people there in the winter, and they love it down there because they get away from this. They get to simplify. And, and they, that's the same reason that Wilson and Scott and that party at Cape Evans loved it. They got away from Edwardian British Empire to a pocket utopia and to a, a human community that is more maybe like a Paleolithic tribe. So all these things are happening at once. And, and I must say, it's, it's radically understudied. Um, the uh, NSF is stupendously clueless, and, and, and many of the scientists down there are having so much fun, and, and are, um, the most that they'll read is Cherry's book, but the later, like Stephen Pine's excellent analysis, The Ice, they, they start, and the first chapter bores them, they stop. So it's an under-theorized space for sure, and uh, for me, a stupendous opportunity. I, when I wrote my Antarctic book, I, ha I said everything I have to say about it, except for this little postscript, because I got to go to Cape Crozier. I'm never going to write more, because everything I had to say or think is in my novel, which is called Antarctica. But there's more to be said by other people, for sure. And it would be super interesting to have some uh, uh, canny and up-to-date knowledgeable scholars uh, studying the literature and the people and the places. And it's never been filmed right, and it's never been photographed right. Thanks. Thanks. I was really amused by your wry commentary on the rigidity of class hierarchies um, on uh, Antarctica both then and now. Um, and it struck me that whereas your experience of visiting Antarctica was so dramatically different from that of the explorers that you studied, that there had been, was an incredible continuity in the way that um, the haves and the have-nots were um, just ruthlessly divided. And I wondered if you could just speak to um, the interplay of those two timescales. On the one hand, our ability to visit, to experience Antarctica has so dramatically changed. On the other hand, nothing has changed. Um, and I just wondered if you could say more about that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, it occurs to me immediately that they both happened in uh, capitalist societies. 
And so the hierarchy, which, you know, for the 1910 expedition was also the military hierarchy, but nevertheless, it was incredibly class-based. And it isn't that different now. The support teams that go down there go down there on a contract basis. They're paid about um, maybe even close to twice as much as they would get for the same job in New England or in Montana. And some of them go back and forth between Alaska and Antarctica because although they uh, don't get paid that much and it's wage uh, contract uh, labor, they do bank it all and, they, and there's nothing to spend it on down there. They send it back to their family and they, and they like it because it's interesting work as such. Some of them haven't seen nighttime for like 10 years. And that might account for the, the weirdness that is famous down in McMurdo. But in any case, you see this happening. And the scientists down there, are they are generating data. They are generating papers. They are generating careers. No matter, and they could be sitting in this. They're often sitting at the same tables with support people. That's one thing about McMurdo that's weird and different is everybody's in the same room. Everybody's in the same galley, and then they're in the same vehicles, and then they're in the same tents. And there are Americans talking together, and Americans don't like to admit that there's class. So the discussions are about other things, and they don't talk politics. And I was down there in 2016, made a phone call home. No, I turned on the wall TV, and there were three channels from New Zealand and one channel from CNN. I turned on the TV, and it was the very moment when Trump won the election in 2016, and I just turned it off and went over to the galley. All the scientists were gathered in one area going, holy moly, maybe we can just stay down here for four years. And then amongst the support team, there were many people going, yeah, we got our guy, and we are going to break things and see what happens. So um, class, it, you only have to look. But it, it's a, uh, exposed and concealed in McMurdo in different ways and in those tents. And as a, I mean, clear, I had the red jacket. I had the name tag. I was basically one of the scientists and one of the, um, the upper class in that, in that scenario. But as a writer who had written science fiction novels, which are definitely lower class literature, outsider literature, and very often read by construction workers and people who work in the trades and do things with their hands, such that um, I was a, a known quantity to a certain number of support teams. So I was able to be a roving reporter and do the thing that some many intellectuals have done and try to uh, see both. And, and you can't mediate because it's a larger overdetermined system. There's nothing you can do except on an individual basis is uh, pay attention to everybody and listen to their stories. And very often the great stories are coming from the support staff, but the scientists have great stories too. So there's no distinctions to be made. I will say the support team down there have a lot of very good musicians, and they would get together and play uh, concerts that if they decided to unleash, since the sun never went down, they could just play for 10 or 12 hours until the bass player would tape up his bloody fingers with duct tape in order to keep going. So there was a sense of, um, OK, Maybe class exists, but down here, we at least get to live a real life. And it was you know, a good wage contract. So I find it interesting and, once again, understudied. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, there's a question over here. But also, I, there are a lot of students in the audience today. And I'm curious if any of them might have any questions as well. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to change the topic a bit. I've brought, some of the students are my own and we're uh, using your work, um, Red Mars and 2312 as inspiration for a solar system exploration and settlement class. So I thought, you know, they're gonna come back and say, well, he didn't talk about space, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was, when, when you talked about the practice hut and the, and the real thing in, in the wilderness, the first thing I thought of was, was Mars mm -hmm. and how, how can we extrapolate how we're preparing here on Earth to the real conditions that we're going to meet there. And, and maybe my students can follow up with some questions. Sure. That. And thanks for that. I am a, a huge fan of the space program. But I always say this now. Space science is an Earth science. And one of the main reasons that I love the space program is exactly for a photo like that. 
a photo from space of Earth, and I have a chance to look at Earth as a planet. And so Mars is interesting mostly for the way that it illuminates the situation on Earth. That was true even when I began writing it, but it's way more true now. And what I've been saying to people is, yeah, I still believe in going to Mars. I still believe in terraforming Mars, which might take more like 50,000 years than, than 50. But it's the reward that we get if we get our act together here on Earth. It's a derivative effect. It's pointless. It's useless. There's no reason to go to space. We can't solve our earthly problems from space. The idea of going to Mars to create a refuge or a second basket for humanity, this is lunatic Silicon Valley talk, and I hate it with a passion. Um, what I think Mars would be good for is as a reward of some two, three, four hundred years from now that we have a steady state um, uh, long-term permaculture on Earth, and then we go to Mars, and it'll be just like Antarctica. Scientific stations tucked around. They'll go there, they'll study, they'll work, they'll build things, they'll come back. Other people will go. That's been true in Antarctica since the Scott expedition. Uh, and now it's regular. The scientists are down there. NSF says you can't stay down there more than 420 days in a row or you'll go crazy. It's just um, their determination. So on Mars, you won't be going to colonize or make a second world. That, that's, that's thousands of years out. But you will be going there, and people will be following them for sure, to go into a scientific base, study this incredible place, which also will be the sublime, right? Even though it looks like Monument Valley, it's not. It will be the sublime, not the beautiful. And then come back, and we'll learn more about operating human civilization and this planet. And so I, 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 I kind of recoup my, my Mars era. And 2312 is all about this. If you simply read 2312, it says what I've just said, more or less. There's one at the back. Great. Hi, thank you for your talk. I am, in fact, one of Professor Frumian's students. So I was going to cool. ask, you said that 19, in your talk, you said that 1911 is like now, and that looking back from 1935 on 1911 would be, I guess, looking back on 2044, looking back on 2020. So I was going to ask hmm. what you see for 2044 and how you think we will retrospectively think about 2020 and like if right now is like the blank revolution or like what you think people in 2044 will think about our current findings and technolo technology and our environmental standings. Oh, thank you for that because it's that's the thought exercise that all of you young people should be running. Uh, how do we get to a good future where when you look back to 2020 you'll say, why were they so stupid? Why were they so slow? In 2312 this period is called the great dithering that we're dithering when the, uh, the danger uh, of civilizational collapse and a mass extinction event is very evident just with the Keeling curve. And the scientific community has been reporting that back since at least the late 90s, and one can even find precursors going further back. But for sure, for 20 years, the warnings have been made by the entire scientific community. And I think of it like this. Say, this, say that we're all in a room together, society, like down at McMurdo, but in this case, it's a normal society where the scientists are back in the back of the room. They're nerds. They're doing their own work. Nobody understands them. They like numbers. They raise their hand around 1999. They go, uh, excuse me, classroom's burning, school's burning. Um, please, we need to kind of get out of here or do something about it. And nobody listens. And then about five years later, with the invention of abrupt climate change, with the invention of the Anthropocene, these are scientists' names for the emergency. They're waving their hands harder and harder. And, and, you know, please, we need to do something. Nobody does anything. Finally, they go over and they hit the fire alarm somewhere, pull it. And, it, and there's a noise ringing in everybody's ears that is as loud as a fire alarm in a hotel, which I hope we don't get because it's really loud. And still nobody moves. And that's when the scientists know they're in a nightmare. That's when you need the scientific revolution to be a political revolution and a post-carbon led revolution. Everybody who believes the scientists have to be on board with them, too. They've, they, the warnings are there. The danger is clear. And we're still in a hotel with the fire alarm going off. And this is what nightmares are like, right? You're caught in syrup. You can't do what you think you need to do. Well, at some point, that'll break. And I think that by 2044, things will be different. 
one way or another. We'll either be in a mass world civil war or else we'll be in a kind of a, a closing in on burning much less carbon, maybe hitting um, carbon neutral as a society, maybe figuring out how to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere and get it back into the Earth's surface so that we begin to curve back down to 350 parts per million, which would be, I think, the obvious thing to try for if we can suck that CO2 down. There are uh, secondary effects to this that might blow all that apart. It might be like planning something inside the wrecked hut on Cape Crozier. Oh, well, we'll just put the hut back together and we'll wait till the wind dies, et cetera, et cetera. These plans may be um, fantasy plans, but we have to do something. So the pressure's on, and by 2044, it'll either be quite a bit worse or it will be quite a bit better. It won't be the same. We're on like a, a, a peninsula that falls hard off in both directions, and you can take the peninsula carefully down towards a good future, or you can fall precipitately down the steep slope into a bad future. But we are on a very narrow peninsula right now. So things will be different in you, when you get older. Remember, Stan told you so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're coming to the close of our time, and I see a couple of students. We just have time for one more question, though, I think. So the first hand, and then we'll wrap up. Thank you for your talk. It was extremely interesting. Um, I just wanted to, I think, ask for an expansion on a couple topics that we've talked about and tie it back into, I think, one of the most interesting slides, at least for me, that you had. Uh, kind of going back to our talk about class down at McMurdo Station and what that means for how people look at their experience there. I noticed one of your slides and you talked about how the Secretary of State visit really interrupted or complicated your visit there. Um, I'm just kind of interested to see what you thought about what he was doing there or how he would have experienced that and in turn what the support staff or maybe the scientists thought about that and just kind of how that emergence of class, because obviously the Secretary of State coming down to a scientific base um, is clearly for scientific diplomacy, perhaps not public diplomacy at another level, and just kind of what that looked like to have um, such an important American leader in a very specifically scientific space. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that because it's a lovely story. Um, Kerry was great. He was Secretary of State. He was only going to be Secretary of State for another month or two, and, and then he was done. And so while he had the wherewithal, he wanted to see Antarctica. So he said, hey, I want to see Antarctica. He made it happen. It was his idea. Come down. Let's see it. It was a touristic, a curiosity. And a lot of people feel that, and he got to act on it with you know, the entire U.S. Navy and NSF helping. NSF heads were going, oh, my God, Kerry's coming. You know, that might help NSF, it might help the US Antarctic program. How cool is this? And then there were storms. And this is why we couldn't tell when he was gonna arrive because there were storms between Christchurch and, um, and McMurdo. That's a five hour flight in the jets. It's an eight hour flight in the prop planes. And there's a point of no return where if you go beyond that point, you only have enough fuel to go to Antarctica. So at the point of no return, very often it happens. They turn around and go back to Christchurch because they can't trust the weather. I think that even happened to him. Finally, he made it, and he didn't have much time left. And in one 24-hour period, they showed him everything cool that was within a helicopter visit of McMurdo, and they took him this, there, and the other. And of course, it's light all the time, so darkness isn't a problem. They took him across to the dry valleys, which are absolutely unearthly beautiful or sublime whatever but ice is falling over these cliffs and then the wind is blowing it away so you've got structural forms or sculptural forms and then they took them left right later i heard the helicopter pilots and this is why i hate helicopters they're laughing in the galley going oh my god i had no more fuel than you would fit in a cigarette lighter when we landed at marble falls in order to resupply i almost killed the secretary of state huh isn't that funny they're all laughing they're falling down laughing I'm thinking, no that's not funny because i'm going to take my flight next week <laughs> and what are you not telling me so after he was done with all that, in the galley, everybody gathered. And so the galley holds maybe 300, and there's 1,000 people there. So I actually went to the other huts, and we saw him on a TV feed from the other huts so that we could make comments, we could drink, and, 
He gave an hour talk, extempore, that was perfectly cogent, perfectly coherent, was about the importance of science, the importance of the world. It was a simply um, amazing, as he said himself, an awesome speech. And he was just tossing it off because he, need, he knew we needed to hear from him and, that, and he felt like saying it. In the current context, I, I, I can only uh, stand stunned and amazed at what a, uh, a quick thinker and excellent articulate speaker John Kerry was. So after he left, everybody was thinking, oh good, it, you know, if only he was still in the job, we might get some more money to run this poor place. Uh, but since then, the US Antarctic program has tried to hide within NSF and not get anybody's attention at OMB or at the White House so that they don't get cut. And that didn't entirely work. The US Antarctic Artists and Writers program that sent me down there uh, in 1995 was cut by Mick Mulvaney and the OMB. Its budget was zeroed out, and this, this budget is like $100. In, in other words, there's no point. It's just that it was an art program, and so therefore it got the ax. So uh, they're right to duck, and the, the weirdo warehouse that they want to build at McMurdo would cost most of a billion dollars, and, or maybe, no, maybe it's only like 300 million, but in any case, they're not even talking about it until a better time comes. And so, you know, maybe they're just like everybody else in that regard. But I got nothing but good to say about Mr. Uh, John Kerry. He was fabulous. Well, uh, speaking of a better time, we're sadly out of time for this session, if hopefully not to change course. But before we go, uh, let's thank our speaker for a really marvelous and inspiring talk. <laughs> <laughs>